Kirti Yanto Ma, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, always chanting my glories. And by doing that, you are free from all material contamination. Such unalloyed devotees, so when that here chanting uh, reaches to the point where one is completely free, Part of, who knows the right word? I'll give you a hint. It's got three letters and starts with an A. All. That's right. Very smart. All of the dust, all of the sinful reactions. Then, such unalloyed devotees, they're able to show mercy. Real mercy is based on being established in one's eternal loving relationship with Krishna fully. Prabhupada makes a statement, knowledge of one's eternal loving relationship with Krishna can greatly enhance one's preaching work or ability to preach. Where is it said? I do not know. Such unalloyed devotees are able to show mercy to the common conditioned soul. And here is the incarnation of Vyasadeva in the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Srila Vrindavan Das Thakur has sung that the devotees of Lord Chaitanya are so powerful that each one of them can deliver a universe. In other words, it is the business of devotees to preach the glories of the Lord. Vrindavan is my home, Mayapur, where the uh, fifth annual Abhishek of Sri Panchatattva will take place on the 1st of March, by the way, um, is a place of worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and Bombay is my office. We go to the office to do business. So New York City is our office. And what is our business? Preaching the glories of the Lord and deliver all conditioned souls to the platform of Karma Mishra Bhakti, Jnana Mishra Bhakti, Shuddha Sattva, pure goodness. That is our duty. So a devotee is necessarily, or to be a devotee, one must have the Brahminical qualifications because a devotee is on the uh, Shuddha Sattva Gun, transcendental goodness. When is a Brahmin, as we see in the life of Ajamil, he could fall down. But an actual devotee, there's no chance of falling down. Shooter shot for. So not only we should come to that stage, but we're meant to deliver others to that stage. Following in the footsteps of the great superlative Mahabhagavat, who no one can come close to match, his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. Tomorrow you'll hear the greatest service is preaching. Continuing our reading of the epic chapter, Divinity and Divine Service. Should do a better job here. It's a little bit wet. It's not wet, but it's some moisture. Narayanam namaskritya naram chayva narotamam devim sarasatim vyasam tatojaya mudirayat nastapareshu padreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama shloke bhaktir bhagavati naishtaki 
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace Iskand's BBD founder Acharya Shila Prabhupada, Canto 1, Chapter 2, Divinity and Divine Service, Text 9. Dharmasya, Hi Apavargasya, Narto, Artaya, Ukpakalpate, Na Artasya Dharma Eka Antasya Kama Labya He Smrita Dharmasya Hi Apavargasya Please in the meter that I'm saying that was a long time ago. I forget what sannyasi said that proper etiquette is that everyone should chant the verse in the meter that the speaker is originating it, not changing it. Dharmasya hyapavargasya. Oh, you changed me to. <laughs> All right. Narto ritaya kalpate. Nartasya Dharma Kaitan Nartasya Dharma Kantasya Kamo Labya Hismrita Kamo Labya Hismrita Dharma Sya Hia Pavargasya Narto Rita Yupakalpate Nartasya Dharmaka Kantasya Kamola Baya Hismrita Dharmasya Hyapavargasya Narto Ritayo Pakalpate Nartasya Dharmakantasya Kamo labaya hi smrita. See the second canto. Dharmasya, occupational engagement. He, certainly. Apavargasya, ultimate liberation. Na, not. Arta Arta. 
for material gain. Upakalpate is meant for. Na, neither. Artasya of material gain. Dharma eka antasya <coughs> for one who is engaged in the ultimate occupational service. Kama sense gratification. Labaya attainment of. He exactly. Smrita is described by the great sages. All occupational engagements are certainly meant for ultimate liberation. They should never be performed for material gain. Furthermore, according to sages, one who is engaged in the ultimate occupational service should never use material gain to cultivate sense gratification. Please repeat. All occupational engagements, All occupational engagements are certainly meant, are certainly meant for, ultimate for ultimate liberation. They should never be performed, never be performed for material gain. For material gain. Furthermore, Furthermore, according to sages, according to one who is engaged, in the ultimate occupational service, the ultimate occupational service should, never use should never use material gain, material gain to, cultivate to cultivate sense gratification. We have already discussed that pure devotional service to the Lord is automatically followed by perfect knowledge and detachment from material existence. But there are others who consider that all kinds of different occupational engagements, including those of religion, are meant for material gain. The general tendency of an ordinary man in any part of the world is to gain some material profit in exchange for religious or any other occupational service. Even in the Vedic literatures, for all sorts of religious performances, an allurement of material gain is offered. And most people are attracted by such allurements or blessings of religiosity. Why are such so-called men of religion allured by material gain? because material gain can enable one to fulfill desires which in turn satisfy sense gratification. This cycle of occupational engagements includes so-called religiosity followed by material gain and material gain followed by fulfillment of desires. Sense gratification is the general way for all sorts of fully occupied men. But in the statement of Sutta Goswami, as per the verdict of the Srimad Bhagavatam, this is nullified by the present shloka. One should not engage himself in any sort of occupational service for material gain or only nor should material gain be utilized for sense gratification. How material gain should be utilized is described as follows. Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishnam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Kadamayam Padati Sva Padanti Kam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Parakamalam 
Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Cha Shri Rupam Sagajatam Sahagatam Sagana Raganatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Vitam Cha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namo Stute Jayatam Surato Pangor Mamamanda Matergati Matsar Vaspa Padam Bojo Radha Madana Mohano Divyad Brindaranya What's going on? Maybe it's smelling the vent. <laughs> Dibyad Brindaranya, Kalpa Drumada, Sri Mad Ratnagara, Sringhasana Sto, Sri Mad Radha, Shilagovinda Devo, Pristalabi, Savyamano, Smarami, Sri Mad Rasa Rasarambi, Bumsi Bhatta Tatastita, Karshan Venu Svanar Gopir, Gopinatha Striestuna. Taptakan Chanagorangi, Radhe Vrindavaneshvari, Vrishabhanu Sute Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Vanchakalpaturubhyas Cha, Kripasandubhya Eva Cha, Tita Anam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha, Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Shiva Sadi Gora Bhakta Brinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Can somebody get me like a mantra card, a bookmark or two? Dharmasya Yapavargasya Narto Vitayopakalpate Nartasya Thaimakantasya Kamula Bayahismita All occupational engagements are certainly meant for ultimate liberation. They should furthermore, according to sages, one who is engaged in the ultimate occupational service should never be gain to cultivate sense gratification. So Prabhupada um, points out in this purport uh, what is the general course, the general tendency of any ordinary man and in any part of the world, what to speak of any part of the world, any part of the universe. Uh, it's described in the 11th canto, even if one is awarded the supreme lifetime, the highest amount of years that you can live. That's the life of Lord Brahma, which is 311 trillion, 40 billion years. Still, Lord Brahma is desirous of sense gratification. So what to speak of puny uh, human beings on this planet, uh, Sense gratification means, uh, fruit of activities means uh, thinking that I can have some enjoyment uh, outside of my eternal loving relationship with Krishna. And as soon as one thinks like that, what to speak of endeavoring for that, one is immediately placed in the illusory energy of the Lord, uh, which ultimately um, guarantees not ultimately, certainly, guarantees repeated birth, death, disease, and old age. And in the human form of life, such, uh, what is that chapter in the third canto, adverse fruit of activities lead one 
to the court of Yamaraj and being, let's say, uh, arrested by the Yamadutas. Uh, the material nature is so designed to punish the corrupt living entity so that the living entity can come to his actual senses. So that is purification. Now, when one takes the devotional service, uh, it is understood that one is not free from uh, the desire to commit uh, sinful activities, although at the time of initiation one promises to physically stop, especially illicit sex. Prabhupada says in one place, of all the four activities, well, certainly meat eating, but at this point he gave stress, illicit sex is extremely sinful. <laughs> Because it is, ba it is ultimately, it is against the original seva bhavana of the soul. And more so it is said that there's absolutely no chance whatsoever of understanding the Lord's uh, pastimes in Vrindavan, his pastimes with Srimati Radharani, the gopis, if one has even a tinge of sex desire. So such activities should only be understood by those who are actually fully, if not functionally, in the renounced order of life. They've renounced all material desires. That is the real renunciation. Uh, he who, uh, what is it? He who lights no fire and performs no work. He is a sannyasi who works as he is obligated. But that work, uh, it's like the neophyte, he's working, he's performing sadhana bhakti, but his realization is not to be compared with the realization of the Uttamadikari, who are doing the same thing. Uttamadikari, the uh, Kanishta Adikari, they're chanting Hare Krishna, uh, they're worshiping the deity, they're offering their food to Krishna, uh, they're worshiping Srimati Tulsi Devi, they're reading the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, but the Uttamadikari's position is by far different and superior and greater. So, the devotee, he is not under the control of Yamaraj or the Yamadutas. So his, uh, who Yamaraj and the Yamadutas, just like someone's a criminal, then he's collected by the police, you know, arrested, handcuffed, sometimes beaten. And then, that's not the end of it. That's practically speaking just the beginning. Then he's brought before the judge, and the judge decides what his long-term ultimate punishment should be. Uh, in the hellish planets, uh, the people uh, who have completely misused the privilege of the human form of life which is specific, it's described in the 11th canto, was, was specifically created by the Lord to facilitate self-realization of himself. So when the human form of life is misused in the animal propensities of eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, that is sinful. Or, and or, that is why for animals who eat, sleep, mate, and defend, following, you know, what is the term, instinct, uh, there is no sin. It's just nature's way. So they've misused the human form of life. So the hellish environment there, it's so horrible to describe, uh, it actually makes people, makes the soul become accustomed if they're going to take the body of a dog or a hog to eat stool or... Uh, you were eating the flesh of others in this life, so then in the hellish planets you eat the flesh of others mutually, and then you become most accustomed to that. Uh, or like living entities that live in 
live in stool or thrive on you know pus and urine and and blood so you're thrown into the Viterani river where such thing where but that's what what it that's what the river is made of so how horrible so krishna and his pure devotees the disciplic succession they handled the case of the uh, soul who's come enough to his senses to realize that I must attempt seriously the process of sadhana bhakti, which is the infallible rope lowered into the well of hell, the hell of the well, the well of hell. And if we just hold on to the rope, uh, we will come out. Can I see the upakhyani upadesh? So it is simply a question of sincerity. Okay, mercy for the earnest only. A, by chance, a person slipped and fell into a deep well and could not get out in spite of all of his efforts. Narottam Das Thakur, he's praying. You know, my Vedic sacrifices travel to holy places of pilgrimage. I think he says one or two other most noble activities are all uh, useless and illusory. And he clarifies it or qualifies it. I know that without pure devotional service, all these things are simply a joke, like putting ornaments on a dead body. So, and he's praying to his spiritual master that without your mercy, there's no question of achieving the ultimate goal of life or even making any real advancement. So in spite of all efforts, he couldn't get out. And therefore he began shouting for help. The chant is exactly like the cry for the mother. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Being merciful, a very kind-hearted passerby brought a piece of long rope which was lowered down into the well so that the man could get out by grabbing the rope. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? Pretty practical. So it sounds like the problem is solved, right? No. The passerby asked the man to catch hold of the rope and try to climb up so he could pull him up. In response, the person started shouting, Oh, my friend, please help me so that I could put my fingers around the rope. <laughs> Purport, such a kind-hearted person is like the spiritual master or the supreme Godhead himself. He has already lowered a rope of rescue into the deep darkness of our ignorance. It is only by, by our earnest effort in catching hold of that mercy that we can be delivered and liberated from material agonies. Unless we extend our best efforts earnestly and qualify ourselves for the Lord's mercy, it is next to impossible that we can be rescued from our fallen condition. So what is that verse in the 14th chapter, uh, Lord Brahma's prayers after he had come to his senses about uh, making the great offense of trying to steal Krishna's beloved Vrindavan devotees, the calves and cowherd boys, tatenu kampam shishukshimano, say the whole thing. No. Yeah. One who um, 
earnestly awaits your compassion, all the while tolerating uh, the reactions of his past fruit of activities, uh, offering you uh, his deepest heartfelt obeisances within the core of his heart. Uh, he uh, goes back home, back to Godhead, or becomes the rightful inheritor of the kingdom, kingdom of God. Mukti Pade is the Dayabak, and achieves Krishna at whose feet all types of liberation reside or uh, worship, all forms of worship, all forms of liberation worship the feet of uh, Krishna, who is the order of real Mukti. So, the main um, heart disease that afflicts us is um, the desire for sense gratification and mental speculation. So we have to be very bold and courageous. It's described in the Bhagavad Gita, weakness of heart. We have to overcome this weakness of heart. Real strength is to surrender to the spiritual master and to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's real strength. That's real heroism. Ordinary man in any part of the world is to gain some material profit in exchange for religious or any other occupational service. Even in the Vedic literature, for all sorts of religious performances, an allurement of material gain is offered. So that is also the Lord's mercy and his pure devotees that the stubborn conditioned soul uh, doesn't want to do what's really beneficial for them. You're, you're chasing, as Prahlad the March was saying yesterday, you're chasing here and there for happiness and you get there, and there's no happiness over there. And you go over there to the next place to try to find happiness, and there's no happiness over there either. And then the devotee comes and says, my dear sir, here's the thing that will make you happy. And because they're complete sold out servants to illusion, they have no time. I don't even have one minute in my entire life to hear about the ultimate good, the <laughs> ultimate truth. <laughs> So unfortunate. So an allurement. To describe that. Uh, I remember being brought to uh, you know, on South Oyster Bay Road in Plainview. It must have been 1963. I was four years old to Dr. Blywise. I had to get a measles shot. And uh, I remember getting a, a lollipop, you know, and a thing. And, and while I was eating the lollipop, <laughs> I got this shot, and I'm screaming, and my mother is. So. so we have to give a candy so that people will, uh, you know, take the actual medicine. Now, if one just wants to, you know, eat all of Dr. Blywise's lollipops, <laughs> <laughs> then one will get sick. Even in the Vedic literatures, for all sorts of religious performances, an allurement of material gain is offered, and most people are attracted by such allurements or blessings of religiosity. Why are such so-called men of religion allured by material gain? Because material gain can enable one to fulfill desires which in turn satisfy sense gratification. Madhavendra Puri, when Gopinath, who was soon to be known as Shirchor Gopinath, was awakened by Gopinath and say, I have kept this sweet rice. You could not see because of my tricks behind the deity curtain. Go and deliver it to him at once. This is in the middle of the night. Now Gopinath, see the devotee is eager to see Krishna, and Krishna is eager 
to unite with his devotee in transcendental loving service mood. So go immediately. And Madhavendra Puri, not at all concerned about name, fame, profit, adoration, even in the realm of religion, what to speak, and, and in devotional service. I want to become famous for my religion. I want to be known as, as, the, as the best devotee, the most famous devotee. I want people to notice me. Madhavendra Puri had not even the slightest desire. So the priest, the Pajari, my dear Madhavendra Puri, where are you? You know, uh, Gopinath has stolen this sweet rice for you. You are the most fortunate person in all the three worlds. And when the Pajari saw Madhavendra Puri's reaction upon taking the sweet rice and tasting it, um, transcendental ecstatic symptoms that are very, very rarely seen anywhere, what to speak of this world, even in the whole universe, he can understand the, the, the position of the saint, Madhavendra Puri, and realize that Krishna's reciprocation with him was just correct. And what did Madhavendra Puri think next? In the morning, there'll be great crowds. In the middle of the night, who starts taking a journey in the middle of the night? Say, I'm getting the heck out of here. And then he remained in seclusion, traveling, nobody knew. And he would keep the pot and the sweet rice was in. And every day would take, a, would eat a little bit of the, you know, crush it up. And when he did, he'd be overwhelmed with ecstasy. And the author Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says, these are wonderful stories. So we want our name and lights. Uh, if I have money, then I should be known as uh, the greatest philanthropist. You know, all of the beggar sannyasis and brahmacharis beg for me. And I like, uh, you know, I kind of enjoy people sucking up to me, you know, because I'm so great, because I have so much money. Where it's actually, the real thing should be the other way around, that a person with material opulence should consider it a privilege. And in some cases, the, the Lord and the devotee, they don't accept. So the person has to beg, please accept this offering. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, this is maybe one of the only known mild reprimands that our Srila Prabhupada was given by a spiritual master who was known to um, be very strict with his disciples. Uh, our Srila Prabhupada was always treated with great kindness and familiarity, friendliness, and even in what some of the disciples perceived as a familiarity. And, uh, that uh, who is this Grihasta devotee that Guru Maharaj is being so friendly with? And they would quote the English saying, fools rush in where angels uh, dare not. And Prabhupada would say, well, fool, well, maybe so, but that's me and I, I love my spiritual master. So one time, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was speaking and one older man leaned over to get Prabhupada's attention and this man was, a, was a, a donor. And Prabhupada just kind of leaned over to just, you know, like obliged, the older man grabs you, you know, what, is, you know, what, what does he want? And our Prabhupada didn't say anything. He was like the man was speaking to him. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta interrupted his, his speaking and said, um, to the man, do you think you have purchased me for your 300 rupee a month donation? Which 300 rupees in the 1930s, how much would 300 rupees be 80 years ago? A lot of money. Yeah, dollars. Right. Have you, you've purchased me because now you own me? <laughs> I have to dance and I have to make do tricks and entertain you? And then he said to our Srila Prabhupada, why don't you come up here and speak instead of me? Which of course is prophetic because uh, 
Srila Prabhupada was given the uh, uh, seat of Vyasasana and became the preeminent disciple of Srila Prabhupada. Speaking on his spiritual master's behalf and fulfilling his spiritual master's desire that Krishna consciousness be spread all over the world. Why are such so called men of religion allured by material gain? Because material gain can enable one to fulfill desires which in turn satisfy sense gratification. Like uh, they have one in Canada, but we just had one here. Thanksgiving. What are we thanking for? We're thanking God for all the sense gratification. We got this wonderful continent from sea to shining sea, you know, purple mountain majesty. And, you know, that we kill and, 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 and uh, more or less mass genocide and, and, and destroy all the Native American Indians, you know, who were living here peacefully for thousands of years. Well, you know, we won't really, you know, we'll just kind of romanticize that a little bit in the history books and then have like actors like John Wayne make movies about it and stuff, you know, but uh, thank God, you know. And that's their religion. And even put it on the dollar bill and God we trust, you know. <laughs> this cycle of occupational engagements included include so-called religiosity followed by material gain and material gain followed by fulfillment of desires. Oh God, give us this day our daily bread. But in this statement of Sutta Goswami, as per the verdict of the Srimad Bhagavatam, this is nullified by the present shloka. So we've heard it before, but I think there's some folks here who haven't heard us read this. So I think it's appropriate to bring out one of our favorite stories, and that is called Balam Rice and Calgi. Yes, Calgi. Could be goat ghee or buffalo ghee, so it's got to be cow ghee, right? There was once a landlord in whose house no servant could ever continue to work for long. The landlord used to appoint new servants frequently, and they would leave the job only after a few days. So I'll give you a clue what this leads to. Prabhupada would say, don't be surprised who leaves. Be surprised who stays. Because, uh, what is it? Tivrena bhakti yogi, yogi na yajeta. What is it? Kevala, kechit kevalaya bhaktiya. The un, the, the you know the very you ever take a magnifying glass? They taught you to do this when you go camping, you know, and the sun comes down. You could light a fire, you know. So this and you know lighting a fire I means it's getting hot, you know. If it's you know, you, you know, there's one crazy person one time and they, they gave him the ghee lamp and he just put his hand on the ghee lamp and wouldn't take it, you know. <laughs> and then it was so bad, he was just, he, I don't know, he was intoxicated, crazy or both. And you start smelling his flesh burning, you know. <laughs> and whoever ever offering in the lamp, you know, some bakta or somebody. Oh, was no, like, no. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so the natural reflex response, things I've seen in the Hare Krishna movement, um, it gets too hot. What is that saying? If you get, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. So this process of pure devotion of of uh, Krishna consciousness given to us by Srila Prabhupada is not, as some people would say, an elementary beginner's. Uh, there's one description of uh, Prabhupada's. Uh, the first six months at 26 Second Avenue. I think maybe Guru Maharaj coined this term. A kindergarten of spiritual life. <laughs> uh, so uh, the first Damodar, the first Kartik, I don't know if even Damodar Astakam was chanted, but just before Prabhupada's Panchatattva and, and, and uh, worshipful altar in his room in the apartment, 26 Second Avenue, he had he got them to buy birthday candles. I don't know how, maybe a pot of salt, who knows, whatever. And said, You offer the 
like we tell people, you know, okay, take the tea light and make a circle. And they ask, Prabhupada, what is this for? To increase your devotion. <laughs> yeah. And five, four or five year old is the teacher is saying, you do like this, you know. Why? Because this will help you to learn how to write, you know. So, ultimately, you can see in the expressions of uh, great pure devotees, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Narutam Das Thakur, that the culmination of devotional service is reinstatement in one's Siddha Deha, one's spiritual body, and one, that one renders the ultimate occupational duty of rendering pure devotional service to Krishna and his eternal associates in Vrindavan. And Rupa Goswami recommends this, calling it the ultimate advice, the culmination of all instruction, Upadesham Rita, is to serve Krishna under the guidance of the Lord's beloved devotees who are deeply attached to his devotional service. So the conditioned soul is so unfortunate, just like the man who was so insincere that even the rope is put to him and he says, can somebody come down and, and put my fingers on the rope? <laughs> He's got the strength to do it, but just he just... Or the story of popcorn bondage, you know, the person is embracing a lot, a big pillar, and he's starving and he's hungry, and some uh, well-wishing, kind-hearted person goes to the nearby dukan and gets him a bag of popcorn. <laughs> dukan means shop, and uh, says, "Here, take the popcorn." But he doesn't, he can't do it because he's just attached to keep embracing the pillar. So how can you? You know, like like the pillars in City Hall, they're like four feet thick, you know, like you can't do it. So you can't accept the real thing if you're attached and to holding on to the material thing. And it's described in the beginning of this verse. We have already discussed that pure devotional service to the Lord is automatically followed by perfect knowledge and detachment. That's one reason why uh, Prabhupada says in one place, retreat from the path of liberation. Because they know what you, we did. The, just like, yeah, we try to give people a book or preach them. And they know what's coming and they're yeah. and run the other way. No, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to be surrendering. Because Krishna consciousness is the only reality and the only truth. No matter how much here we're in an ocean of untruth and everybody else is mutual ad admiration society, everybody else is you know, guaranteeing to the other that yes, there is no Krishna, you're Krishna, and engage in sense gratification to the best of your ability. And everyone else is encouraging each other in that way, even though they're all envious of each other. you know. And if somebody... Uh, tries to, we were hearing the term, escape from the laboringth, then immediately he's pointed out to be, you know, crazy or just antisocial or just, you know, just, you know, what are you doing, you know? Anyone have any experience of fam friends and family members? When you take the Christian consciousness, then what is this, you know? Whereas before it seemed like, oh, a very healthy, happy home, and we love you, and you are this and that, and you know, everything's beautiful. But as soon as you want to stand up for truth, folly to be folly to be wise, where ignorance and bliss is is bliss. Hardly one man in a thousand realizes this. Manushinam sahasreshu kastunyatate siddhaye. Nobody could continue the work for long. The landlord used to appoint new servants frequently, and they would leave the job after only a few days. Weeks, months, or a year or two, maybe. The landlord was much perturbed at this. It was almost impossible for him to maintain the household work without any servants. So this movement is meant to take over the entire world. And, and restructure and reform the whole human society. Why is it that there's just like a handful of us little monkey 
like soldiers <laughs> trying to do something in a city with 14 million people. One day he was lamenting to one of his friends, how unfortunate I am, not even a single servant could stay. What's the solution? Then the friend adv advised the landlord. So you go to Dr. Blywise and you get some lollipops. <laughs> if, you follow my, if you follow my advice, then your servant won't leave even if you want to get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> you recruit any servant and feed him with fine variety of balam rice with cow ghee. Mm -hmm. And you feed him twice a day. After maintaining him in this manner for six months, then you can start pushing him for more rigorous jobs and work. And you'll just see what happens. Actually, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta he, um, with his disciples, when they would like excel in something, they would give all types of names, you know, for their learning or their preaching work. And you know, like, they, you know, it's like, you know, you have your initiated name, but you might have like two, three, or even four appellates and suffixes along with it. And, you know, like you'd be addressed like this all the time. And the landlord did as his friend advised. After relishing, Balam rice with cow ghee for six months, no other variety of rice was palatable to his servant. Then the landlord, after the lapse of six long months, started pressuring the servant with all sorts of rigorous jobs. The servant thereafter started making complaints to the assistance of the landlord. I'm going elsewhere if so much pressure has continued to be put on me. In this way, whenever there was a little more work to do, the servant used to say, I won't stay here any longer. One day the landlord told him, you can go wherever you want. It's a free country, nobody's, nobody's locking you up. The servant looked for some alternative job elsewhere, but he could not have the satisfaction anywhere he went of the same quality, a fine variety, uh, balam rice and cow ghee. Poor little thing. <laughs> At last he came back helplessly, humbly, to the house of the landlord and continued to stay for a long time. But whenever there was some additional workload, he used to go elsewhere for relief. But as soon as he remembered the satisfaction of balam rice with cow ghee, he would immediately return to the landlord's house and used to say that he had developed a sentiment for the landlord. Isn't that nice? And that's why he was unable to stay anywhere else in peace. After a few years, when the landlord happened to meet his friend, who had given him the advice in the first place, he shouted out in great joy, all glories to Balam Rice and Kalgi. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's purport is smacking that ball right out of the wall, a real grand slam nailer here. This antidote gives us a moral about the influence of women, wealth, and reputation. Nadanam Najanam Nasundarim Kavitam Vajagat Ishakamaye. Mama Janmani Jamna Ishvare Bhavatad Bhakti Rahaitu Kitvai. Oh my Lord Jagadisha, I do not want materialistic wealth. I do not want to enjoy with beautiful women, nor do I want unlimited numbers of followers. I only want your causeless, unmotivated devotional service life after life. For which all people are desirous. It is very difficult to find even one person willing to offer causeless devotional service to Lord Sri Hari in this world. Not a single person wants to stay steadfastly in the devotional institution of Lord Sri Krishna's family environment. 
That is what this material world is. Only motivated with material sense gratification and mundane desires for a few days. Some would like to pretend to offer services to Lord Sri Krishna's family and then would again revert to different aspects of material gain, position, and reputation, religion, wealth, fruit of work, or liberation to satisfy their thirst for sense gratification. With a view to attracting, now here is a very deep understanding of the mercy of an actual Acharya. With a view to attracting such persons by all means and to enlighten them of their latent potential, your ever well-wisher. All benevolent spiritual masters arrange for balam rice and cow ghee to feed them. In other words, spiritual masters make every attempt to retain such truant persons. Anybody ever hear play hooky from school and get caught by the truant officer? I don't know. I heard of such things in the 60s, but I never saw them, you know. But they had like uh, old, old little comedy sitcoms, move, little movie vignette, the little rascals from the 1930s where like they'd play hooky from school and some big bad man would catch them at a butterfly net, you know. <laughs> Coming to school, you know. Actually, Srila Prabhupada didn't want to go to school, and his mother had to hire a man to take him to school. Yeah. <laughs> of course, that's... Uh, yeah. In other words, spiritual masters make every attempt to retain such truant persons within the family environment of Lord Sri Krishna by way of providing various sorts of position and reputation for them. In the beginning, such persons may often play truancy by going away from Lord Sri Krishna's family. And when they continue to receive some award, prestige, position, honor, etc., in the form of Balam Rice and Kauki, <laughs> or the like, some of them pretend to show up some sort of soft sentiment towards the landlord or the spiritual master. Oh, Guru Day! <laughs> Thereafter, such persons are not likely to go away, even if they are asked to. Therefore, all glories to Balam Rice and Kaugi. <laughs> the earnest enterprise on the part of the landlord for the performance of his essential services to save everybody on this planet is tantamount to the earnest desire of a spiritual master or a sincere devotee to satisfy Lord Sri Gauranga. Whereas the servant is very well comparable to all sorts of servitors who pretend to serve their spiritual masters in a firm attitude. And Balam rice with cow ghee may rightly be thought of as a servant's desire for position, honor, and reputation. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Right. <laughs> he says, Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you for your class. Thank you for your wonderful class. In this verse, the performance of Dharma for the purpose of performing sex gratification is contemned. The Dharma for a bhakti practitioner is to use material assets and everything for the service of the Lord and his devotees. As you mentioned, even Lord Brahma has desires to perform sense gratification than what to speak of tiny humans. Srila Prabhupada gives the remedy for the problem in the purport, saying the pure devotional service is to the Lord is automatically followed by perfect knowledge and detachment from material existence. So it seems that the first step towards pure devotion is attaining perfect knowledge and, and getting detached from material existence. Prabhu, can you please elaborate how to attain perfect knowledge when we have our mental filters to accept what we like and reject what we do not like? 
which are big impediments to acquiring perfect knowledge. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Attention. Then let me try to say something more. <laughs> Just do it. One might not be expert, but if one turns the screw under the guidance of the expert, then one's actions are naturally free from the contamination mm. of uh, material illusion. When to say that pure devotional service is the supermost occupation of the human being. So you should read the um, books of Srila Prabhupada, which will help you to understand what is the proper mentality and understanding. And uh, all your questions will be answered by reading Prabhupada's books at the same time performing devotional service. Next, if anything. Mm -hmm. I have a comment. Um, from, um, you had you know, how you said, you know, how brahmacharis become brahmacharis and your parents go crazy and certain things like that. Mm -hmm. um, my own experience was like Grihastha devotees was in the movement like when they kind of heard about this thing they're like no you can't leave you have to work you have to work you can't avoid it and it's like you have oh, to suffer you yeah. can't just leave like that we also did it so you have to also do it oh, I had various Grihastha devotees say this as well like that have you read this Chanto Prajapati Daksha Cursed by Nara have you read that Sixth Canto Sixth Canto Okay, that's your that's your homework. Okay, yeah. That will help you understand. Yeah, Prajapati Daksha, that was his argument that, you know, I'm I'm actually a devotee and I'm actually acting saintly because I'm following my occupational duty very nicely of uh, raising children, and you know, you have like, not once but twice, in the third set. Children were daughters, so no one would have left them alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that unless one experiences the uh, sand and the sweet rice of going through Grihasta life, then one won't. Then one won't, <laughs> then one won't be, um, um, let's say, sufficiently experienced to get free from material desire. So by you instructing them to immediately take to the sannyas order of life, even though they're young boys, you've done a great harm to them and to me. So therefore, you are unsaintly. So they don't understand that, and Prabhupada said, they don't understand that, and similarly, I've been cursed by the, the, the um, parents of my disciples, but they don't know that I have brought them completely to the path of realization. In other words, again, as Brahmanism is included in um, Vaishnavism, so in the same way, the renounced order of life is automatically achieved by one who is a pure devotee of Krishna. It's just a, This type of criticism is just another aspect of envy of Krishna mm -hmm. and envy of the process of devotional service. So just like they're envious of Krishna, so sense gratification is envious of, of the activity of devotional service. So, what is it? One who has given up his so-called responsibility to parents and forefathers and society is not a debtor. And one, well, one who has surrendered, he has fulfilled all of his debts. He doesn't have to fulfill it. Simply by surrendering to Krishna, everything is satisfied. And actually, that is the symptom of the topmost devotee, that he realizes that. As Krishna tells him in the 11th canto. Yes? I had a similar experience when I was when I joined full time, and then my parents, because understanding that I was inclined to Vaishnavism, uh, figured out that I, I would not listen to anyone who was not a Vaishnava. So they, they took me to a Sri Vaishnava yeah. Sanyasi. And this sannyasi was like, first he was talking, and, and then in the end he said, 
I, because in, in Sri Vaishnavism, you can't take sannyas until you pass the blessed ashram. I work so hard, your parents are working so hard, and you think you can go back home, back to God without working hard like us? <laughs> you know, what do you think of yourself? And he says, you, you Hare Krishna, write a few books and go and chant Hare Krishna, and you think you can go back home, back to God? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. So it, it, was, it was amazing to see that. Was just, yeah. There was no point in even discussing. I just closed my ears and, and left, it, left the place because he was so offensive. I don't know if it's exact parallel, but it comes to my mind that uh, in the uh, strife for the Bombay Juhu land, uh, Mr. the so-called uh, Mr. Nair and Prabhupada, you know, before everything completely broke down, and the man, you know, just revealed, you know, uh, just how nasty, nasty he was, and more or less he had a heart attack and died shortly thereafter. <laughs> that there was a meeting and that he had brought like a, a guru with him and mystic, you know, and the idea was that he was afraid that Prabhupada, his mystic potency was so great that it would bewilder his mind and he <laughs> have to sign over the deed or something and so uh, there was going to be a meeting, you know, but uh, Prabhupada understood what was going on and said, you know, he told his, he said, uh, uh, he may, I think he had, had it communicated that f to one of his servants, Giri Rod Swami of the Mount Krishna Maharaj, that Prabhupada Guru does. Prabhupada is uh, tired now and he's going to take some rest. We'll have the meeting in a few hours or something, a couple of hours. And, uh, you know, and so they took it as a thing that, that, that the Guru and this Mr. Nair were in another room and they both went to sleep. And Prabhupada wasn't sleeping. <laughs> so then, you know, the, the guru was like a big man, maybe overweight, and he was soundly sleeping and snoring, and, you know, and so then he had the <laughs> proper directed to Mal, Giri Raja to Mal Krishna to go in and wake up Mr. Nair and say, Prabhupada wants to see you. So ultimately he brought him in and they discussed that they went to see him and all the gurus in the other room sleeping. You, know? <laughs> 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 you can read that in the Lilam Rita. All right, so we can stop here. Thirty seconds before the deadline. Yeah, I so mean, okay, okay, you should ask it, and I have to answer it. It wasn't really a question. It was just a comment of you know, anyone doing you know in a Monday job or anything, they want you to basically have to do a Monday job and suffer as they have. You know, right? My parents did it. Their parents did it. So you have to continue. Misery so loves break. company. Misery yeah, loves you break company. from that. You know, situation. There's like they're a bum. You know, they have to suffer. Right. Yeah, we're 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 guaranteeing uh, repeated birth and death, disease and old age for ourselves, and, and you have to do it too. <laughs> in the spiritual world, everyone's in exchanging transcendental bliss, and in the hellish planets, everyone is exchanging misery and agony. <laughs> so. Um. So that's why devotees are we, we give up a satsang a Vaishnava char. Bhakti Nanda Kaur says, and those so-called family members who are averse to you, I would consider no better than strangers. Oh my God! Uh, so, um, what if one uh, has the capability of going? and basically building their own life. And they don't have to work for anyone. They're basically their own boss, but they still work. They, they, they work to, to grow their own crops, build their own house. They have a family. They build everything themselves. They don't answer to anyone, but they still work. What, what oh, is yeah, that? I mean, you're serving Krishna. There's that very wonderful painting, which is in the original Nagun Bhagavad Gita. It's, uh, Be thou happy by this yagna, because by its performance, all desire... So it seems like there's a, a young uh, married couple, they're dressed as devotees. Of course, it looks like a hot place in the painting, so the man doesn't have a shirt on. But then there's a woman in the sorry, she's holding a little newborn baby. And the demigods are up there, and the rain, and sun, and moon <laughs> are coming down, and the crops are growing, and like that. So that's living the way that Krishna wants us to live 
in householder life, in productive life, in occupational life is different. This entire civilization is, is demoniac. Yeah. And said Barlada and Anamaraj were saying, you know, they create all these problems and then they are very, very busy uh, devising methods to counteract the problems, <laughs> which they themselves, you know, unnecessarily created in the first place. And they're very proud of it. So that's called complicated living with no thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're interested in simple living and high thinking. Actually, that's right. Every man should have his own piece of land and um, take care of his own. And just doing that, you don't have to work all day, all year. What is this? People get in their car and go on the train and 50, 100 miles of people in Grand Central today, they're coming on Metro <laughs> North from all these faraway places. And, you know, they, they, it was like a, spending like $600 or more a month just on the what? commuter rail. Yeah, I mean, like $600 going, a month? Why not? I mean, like $20 to go somewhere. <coughs> That's crazy. Go to like Stanford, Connecticut. It's like 20 bucks one That's way. That's crazy. And $40 a day. My God. Times I mean, 20, there's $800 a month. My God. And then you have to pay for the subway ride, which if you see the you know, public hearings, you know, in all the different languages, which is basically, you're going to eat it and you're going to like it, you've got no choice. <laughs> we're going to increase the cost of the subway to $3, and the monthly will be $5 more, and, you know, that's right. So, okay, they're increasing again? Yes. $3. To $3. When did they increase it last time? Last year. I don't, know, I don't remember when I joined you. Year, two years ago. Oh, yeah, they just when I joined you, it was two twenty-five. When I was a kid in the nineteen sixties, <laughs> it was thirty-five cents. Oh my <laughs> God! Three dollars. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah, Mr. Rajkumar. Thank you, Jai. Jai, Rajkumar, Jai. Actually, we're when my father was a teenager, I think it was like a nickel or ten cents. So I actually looked up one one time one of the first big houses.